David. Let's give David a big hand. Good job. Good job. Well, it's so good to be back in this house and see your smiling faces, and I absolutely mean that. The cows were fun, but you just look so much better and smell better. And so uh, it's good to, good to see everybody. If you've got your Bibles this morning, lift them up and repeat after me. Say, this is my Bible. Every word in it is true. I am who it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. Today, I'll be taught God's word. It's his truth transforming every part of my life. And I'll never be the same. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You guys sound awesome. We are in week six of the Beatitudes, and, and what an amazing, amazing series. At least for me, I know it's been awesome to be able to really soak up what Jesus was saying and as he talked to us about living a blessed life. How many of you want to live a blessed life? Uh, yeah, most of us do. How many of you want to live a cursed, miserable life? Can I see your hands? Anybody? You know? I literally don't know anybody that ever thinks, you know what? I want my life to be a disaster. I mean, how fun would that be? Just No, well, none of us feel that way. And yet Jesus comes in in this sermon and he says, listen, the way my kingdom works, if you want to be blessed, here's how you do it. That's pretty awesome. He's basically, he's basically, Ryan, giving us the recipe for having a blessed life. And, and when we look at the word blessed, as we talked about, it's really about having happiness or joy in life. And here's what's interesting. If you look at the Old Testament, where this all comes from, you look at the Old Testament, God blesses people. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all these old people, we look at all these people in the Bible, and, the, and God, when he would interact with them, he would say things like, I am going to bless you. I'm gonna bless your generation. I'm going to bless the people that come after you. God's talking about this blessing that came on their lives. Jesus, now, now, so we look at the Old Testament, we see that, but then Jesus comes in the New Testament and he uses the word blessed, not blessing, blessed. And that's the present tense. Words are important. And so when he says blessed, he doesn't mean just later. He means right now. He means blessed in the moment, blessed in your life today. I know there's a part of, of us as Christians that we realize one of these days we're not going to be here. We're going to be in heaven and everything's going to be awesome. And you know what? That's true. But Jesus talked to us about having blessings here. And when you look at this sermon, I don't want you to think it, it to think about when you look at this series, when you read the scriptures, that it's just about being blessed later on down the road. God's talking about wanting to bless us in this moment. There's a truth in that that we need to get down on the inside of us. Because I really do want to be blessed. I want to walk in the fullness of what God has for me here. I don't want to have to wait till I die until everything get good, gets good. I want to be able to walk in the fullness of what God has today. I want to see my kids blessed. Miles turned 26 yesterday, Friday. Stand up, Miles, you cute little thing. Come on. Look at him. Look at him. 26 years old. Can't believe Trisha has a son that old. That's amazing. But, but I want my kids to be blessed, and I want my grandkids to be blessed in the generations after. Yes, but I want to walk in the blessing now. Because there's something attractional about the gospel where Jesus says, you can have this now. You can walk in the fullness of the blessing of God today. And so when we read this series I want, or, and we study this, I want you to get that down. Jesus is talking about now. And so let's read this. Let's read Matthew 5, 1 through 8. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside, sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. And he said, blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Last week, Doc talked about blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And today, I'm going to talk about blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. God, I thought, man, that's a powerful thought. 
when we can have a pure heart and then be able to see God, experience the presence of God, see what God is doing in the world. Philippians 2.15 is, is one of the key scriptures I want to lose, use today. Becky's got it on the screen. Here's what Paul says to the church at Philippi. He said, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. You know, uh, there are very few things more innocent than a child. See, Chris, Chris has got the baby over there. We see these children are so innocent. I love the fact that I, I just thought it was such a great example today. The kids come in and they're all wearing pajamas. You know, and, and I think it's so cool that they don't even think it's a big deal. It's like, hey, let's get up. We're going to go to church. We're going to have donuts. And guess what? We get to wear pajamas to church. And so what do they do? They didn't get up and go, I wonder what everybody's going to think of my pajamas. They just said, hey, we're wearing pajamas to church. Cool. Let's go do that. Adults don't think that way. Because as we get more, quote unquote, mature, we, we start building these things around us and we lose, listen to me, we lose innocence. We begin to care more about what people think. We, begin, we, we lose the joy of life. We, we begin to lose those things. The kids are coming in and we're like, man, I'm wearing PJs eating pajamas. Look at those adults all dressed up and stuffy. I'm worshiping Jesus comfortably. Right? There's something to that. I was thinking about that this morning. There's something to that. Getting up here and shooting baskets and doing different things. And, and say, yeah, church is just where they do life. And yet, something happens in our life as we mature. And we begin to put all these restrictions and all these things starts happening. And we begin to lose our innocence. I was thinking about when I first received Christ at the age of 16. And how in love with Jesus I was. And how everything just seemed different to me because I saw God moving and I saw things happening. And, and there was this innocence in my life because things, things had been restored. And notice what happens here. here. Here's what happens. God gives us a new heart. The scripture tells us that when we receive salvation, what he does is he takes our stony heart, our hard heart away and he gives us a new heart of flesh, an innocent, pure heart like a pajama wearing kid. And there's joy with that. Because what he has done, what salvation really is, you guys need to catch this. What salvation really is, is the old is gone, the scripture tells us, and the new has come and we become renewed. We become newborn babes in Christ. And so this joy gets to be restored in our life. All of a sudden our life can become worth living. And we have to protect that. Because a lot of times we lose the innocence of our salvation. We become impure because of the things that happen to us in the world. And our hearts can become hard again, even as Christians. Some of the most bitter people I know are Christians that have hardened their heart. Have you ever been around a, a hard-hearted, mean Christian? I have. That's no fun. They're not attractional at all. As a matter of fact, when I get around people like that, if I didn't know anything about who Jesus was, I wouldn't want to have anything to do with him. Because if I'm going to be like that, I don't want that. But the joy of the Lord, the truth of who Jesus is when he gets down on the inside of you and the joy that comes with that is a life-changing thing. You know, I think about God showing up in the little things when we need him. Uh, one of the things that happened to me in the course of the week, uh, out checking cows one afternoon, uh, this is about 10 or 12 days into this deal, and, and Trish was exhausted, I was exhausted, none of us were sleeping great, and I went out, was checking the cows, and I was just overwhelmed. I was just overwhelmed. I was emotionally worn out, I was spiritually worn out, I was physically tired, and I, was, and I, and I drove out, to where, the, where one of the pastures where a bunch of cows were, 50 cows or so, and I drove out and just stopped and turned off the ranger and just laid my head down on the steering wheel. 
just just stopped. And and I felt something. And I look over <laughs> and this calf has walked up to me and has stuck his head up on my leg. <laughs> I've got a picture of it in my phone. I'll show you if you want to see it. And he's looking up at me like, you all right? <laughs> Quickly followed by, you got something to eat? Because <laughs> that's who I am to them. <laughs> I'm like the food truck. But it was in that moment that the innocence, the the purity, the, the reality of the love of God that just shows up in the midst of a challenging situation. We need that kind of relationship with him that is intimate. Where we slow down enough in the hectic pace of everything we're dealing with. I mean, one of the things I know is we, we went out of town and Ukraine got invaded and fuel prices doubled. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, what in the world? Jesus, where are you? And he says, the pure in heart will see God in these moments. We need to see him. We need to experience him. But the way that happens is when our hearts are pure towards him. So my question was, is, is going through this series, is how can I have the kind of heart that is pure before God? I don't know about you, I need him. This is too much. We need his presence. We need his strength. We need his protection. We need, his, we need him. This, this situation we've been dealing with now for the last couple of years has just shown us over and over and over again how much we need a supernatural, present, real God to help us. Yeah. Amen? Amen? And if I want to see him that way and experience him that way, my heart has to be pure in our relationship. So I've got just three things today I want us to cover. Three things. Everybody turn to your neighbor and say, three things. Three things. Three things. Won't take more than two hours. No, I won't do that to you. So how do we sustain or how do we keep a pure heart? How do we do this? Number one on your notes today. You need to be quick to believe. You need to be quick to believe. What does that mean? Well, here's the opposite of that. If you have doubt, you have fear, and you have unbelief, it will create impurity in your heart. What does that mean? Well, we get in trouble. Here's how, here's the, the RSV, the redneck version. We get in trouble when we don't believe what God said. The reason every service we say, this is my Bible, every word is true, is because we have to recognize that if that is true and I believe it, then I have to, those promises in the Bible, those things that God says, do I believe them? Because if I believe them, those are the things that sustain me in seasons like we're in right now. Do I believe, as an example, do I believe that everything that happens to me, God's going to work out for my good? The scripture says that, but do we believe that? If we doubt that, what that does is now that creates impurity in our lives. And it creates confusion and uncertainty and it gets us off track. And that's when we get in trouble. So we need to be quick to believe what God says. Now, listen, I want you to understand something today. It is okay to have doubt about certain things because you don't understand something. I want to be quick to, to point that out. It's okay as long as you're seeking to understand. Okay? You, you can say, I don't understand something about this in Scripture, or the Scripture says this, that, and the other thing. I don't understand. So what you do is you begin to search those things out, and as you begin to search them out, God will reveal himself to you in those things. Jesus was walking down after his resurrection and he met some guys on the road to Emmaus and he was talking to them. They didn't recognize that it was him. And he said this to them. He said, oh, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Sometimes 
And you can even do this today. I can show you scripture after scripture and explain what God says about you or, or who he says you are. But if you walk out of here not believing that, it's not going to change anything. We have to embrace the scripture and allow God to begin to speak to us. We need to have what I talked about earlier, that childlike faith. I don't have to comprehend or understand how God's going to do everything. I just need to trust that he's got it under control. You say, well, pastor, how's God going to work out everything going in the world right now? I don't know. But he said that in the world we were going to have tribulation, but be of good cheer because I've overcome the world. He said that, that greater is he that is against us or in us than he that's in the world, right? He said all these scriptures in our lives that that. If we will apply them to our lives and believe them, they will help us succeed. But if we choose to not believe them, they will create fear, doubt, and unbelief, and we will not succeed. It is literally that simple. So I need to be quick to believe what God said. I don't have to understand how he's going to do it. I just believe that he will. Somebody, Hazel, you need to hear that today. Amen? So let's look at something else here. If, if you feel like... Doubt, unbelief, fear are things that you deal with. You're not alone. Anybody ever heard of Thomas in the Bible? We call him Doubting Thomas. But that's really not fair, is it? He's just us. And Thomas wasn't there when Jesus showed up back to the disciples the first time. He was out doing something. And then other people were seeing Jesus, and he hadn't seen him yet. And so everybody's excited telling Thomas, hey, we saw Jesus. What does Thomas say? Unless I see his hands. The marks of the nails and place my finger into the marks of the nails and place my hand into his side. I will never believe. Maybe some of you are at that place. God, I, unless I get some proof that you're there, unless you show me something, can I just tell you something? He will show up. And it will usually be at the most unexpected moment. Can you imagine Thomas said that and all of a sudden Jesus said, hey, what's up? That is the redneck version. <laughs> and he's like, uh. But you notice something here. This is important. This is for all you guys that have questions. Jesus did not condemn him. He didn't do what I'd have done. Oh, you want some realness? I'll show you some real. That's patow. How you like me now? No. He said, here. You wanted to feel the nails? Feel it. You want to feel where they jabbed me with the spear? Touch it. Thomas' response is one of the most beautiful in the entire Bible. My Lord and my God. When you need him to show up, he will show up, even if he has to use a calf. He will show up in those moments that you need him. God is not scared of your questions, but seek him and watch him do something amazing. Hebrews 3.12 says this, take care, brothers and sisters, lest there be in any of you an evil unbelieving heart we got to guard our hearts i'm going to talk about that some more in a minute i'm going to camp out here on number two for just a few minutes how do we keep a pure heart how do we sustain and and just have a pure heart at all times the second thing is we need to be quick to forgive i wrote this in my notes and you need to write it down unforgiveness creates bitterness unforgiveness creates bitterness there was a small town, and people in the town began to get sick, and I mean really, really sick. And so they began to study to see what was going on, and it was just different ages, different groups of people. There was, they couldn't figure out why is everybody all of a sudden getting sick. And so they began to do these examinations and these tests on people, and then they began to test the environment, and they found out that the city's water supply had been contaminated. There was something wrong with the city's water supply. So 
So they began to search uh, in the area. They began to do a search and test, and they began to go up, and, and they thought, well, it's not, it's not right here. There's something else. So they began to send out teams to look into the streams that were feeding into the reservoir. And one of the teams, as it was going up a stream, found a cow that had fallen down into the water and died. And that cow had begun to decay. And that decay had flowed down into the reservoir and contaminated the water supply. And everybody that drank, many people that drank out of that reservoir got sick. So what did they do? Well, it was very simple. They removed the cow out of the water and the water began to flow, as the water flowed, it began to decontaminate the reservoir. That is a beautiful, simple, very straightforward example of what happens when bitterness gets in our life. When we become bitter and we walk in unforgiveness, that unforgiveness contaminates our entire life. But notice what it does. It doesn't just impact you. It makes people that you come in contact with sick. I've seen this a thousand times probably at a minimum in my life. People get hurt, wounded. They begin to carry pain. And what happens is it begins to decay in their life. That bitterness begins to grow. That unforgiveness begins to grow. And then it begins to impact every area of their life. But then it begins to impact those closest to them. First, their family then their friends, then their classmates, then people at work. And that, that sickness begins to grow and it begins to contaminate everything that it touches. We have to be quick to forgive. And not just other people, but also who else? Ourselves. The hurt and the pains of the past, if left untended and unforgiven, will make you sick and everybody around you as well. Matthew 19, eight says this, this is Jesus talking. He said, he was saying to the religious people standing around him, he said to them, because of your hardness of heart, everybody say hardness of heart. Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. He was saying you had a pure heart, but then Pain, sickness, unforgiveness, things begin to creep into your life and it began to change your environment and change your heart. And your hearts begin to become hard and that's what happens when unforgiveness can step in our lives, guys. It can poison us. Proverbs 4, 23 says this, keep your heart with all vigilance for from it flow, what? The springs of life. From now on, whenever you have unforgiveness in your life, I want you to think about that cow. That decaying thing in that spring that just begins to flow in and it begins to contaminate your life. Guys, please. As I was reviewing my notes this morning, the Holy Spirit was talking to me about this. And this is a big thought that I have. I gave it to Becky. It's not in your notes, but I think it's worth writing down. Sometimes... We are more interested in keeping clean dish, dishes than keeping clean hearts. I want to say that again. Sometimes we are more interested in keeping clean dishes than keeping clean hearts. We'll spend time, I mean, you'll go to a meal, you get done with the meal, what do you do? You, you clean that plate off, don't you? And then you take it, and if you've got a dishwasher, you put it in the dishwasher. You run it at a sanitizing level so it cleans all that bacteria out. We are just coming out of a season where we washed everything. Wash your hands. How many times have you heard that? You guys have sprayed more cleaning agent on your hands over the last few months. Johnson & Johnson thanks you. Right? Right? But we have just been inundated with, wash your hands, wash your hands, keep your hands clean, keep your hands clean. But I would say to you today, we get more interested in keeping our hands clean than keeping our hearts pure. And that goes in and it begins to defile us. Just like you get sick if you don't wash your hands, what happens when you let your heart go untended? When you allow bitterness and unforgiveness to live here, it contaminates you. It makes you miserable. You know who you are.
Now, I'm going I'm to do a confession. Bible, people say confession is good for the soul, right? So, so how many of you filled up with gas lately? <laughs> yeah, Danny, bless your heart. So I, I went down. My dad's got a big F-350 pickup. So I decided the other day I needed, I needed to put some fuel in the truck. And so I, I drove down to, to put, it's a diesel. So, so I pull up to the pump. And I said, I'm just going to put a little bit in it. $40. It's like two gallons. <laughs> and, and as I sat there and I put that in there, I literally took a picture of it. But someone had taken a sticker of the president. <laughs> now, now, I'm going somewhere. This isn't a political statement. They had a picture of the president pointing at that. And he said, I did that. Here's what I noticed over the last 14 days of, of filling up with gas multiple times. Four, I counted, four of the five times that I did that, there were people next to me filling up the other side. Four of the five of those were women. I got into conversations with four of the five of those people while we're fueling up the pump. Every one of them was as angry as anybody I've ever been around in my entire life. But I'm a pastor. I'm a pastor, Marty. And, and so as I sat there fueling the pump up the first time in my dad's truck, there's a lady across from me had a, a SUV, newer SUV. She's sitting there very nicely dressed and, and she's putting it, it's a, and she goes, she goes, what do you think about that? I said, well, I don't like it. What do you think about that? She cussed like a sailor. <laughs> and I just sat there and looked at her, and I looked up at that little picture that was on that thing, and I thought, I know, right? <laughs> no, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. I didn't do that. But, but I sat there, and what happened is I started getting angry, like really angry. And then the next time I feel it was more. And there was one of those stickers there at the next place I went. Three of the five places I went, little stickers were there. Last night we were driving home, pull into the gas station on the highway. Dave, you love this. Pull in the gas station. Guy next to me pulls up in a BMW. Big, tall, uh, black gentleman. And, and he's sitting there and he's filling up. Uh, he goes, what do you think? <laughs> He was number four of the five. So I said, what do you think? He goes, you know what I started doing, bro? I said, what? He goes, I stop every hundred miles and put gas in it so it doesn't feel like it hurts so bad. <laughs> he really did. He said, I just put in like 30 at a time and it feels normal. And we both sat there and laughed and talked about how bad it was. There was one of those stickers last night, another one. And I was angry. I mean, really angry. And I told Trish, I said, let me tell you what the problem is. <laughs> she said, what's the problem? And I began to describe to her in great detail the problems and whose fault it was. And then the Lord gave me scripture. Look at Ephesians 4, 31 through 32. Let all what? And what? And what? And what? Ooh, say clamor. And what? Be put away from everybody. Everybody say me. Along with all. Gum it. <laughs> Be what? To who? Even the president. And then what's the next one? Now hold on before we go to this next one. 
<laughs> Some of y'all are like, I should have stayed home. <laughs> What's the next one? Read it to me. Forgiving one another. Now watch this. All the things he just said come down to this one thing. Why? Read the last thing. Ouch is right. Do I think we have a problem? Yep. Do I think I know who the problem is? I have a strong opinion. <laughs> is how I feel going to change anything? Who can change the situation? Christians? Yeah, if you're not a Christian right now, you go, hey, you ain't talking to me. <laughs> We got to get our hearts right. Come on now. Pastor loves you. Think about that, please. <laughs> More importantly, God loves you. He's trying to get your attention. Let me read it again, all in context. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander. Boy, he made up. What a list. Be put away with all. And then he said, oh, I forgot one. Along with malice. <laughs> <laughs> be kind to one another tender hearted forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you see part of our problem is we judge other people by their actions but we judge ourselves by our intentions do I agree with what's going on nope But the best thing I can do is pray for those in leadership. Vote. Absolutely. Do the right thing. You know, all I did when I was talking to all those people is we just got me. I mean, it was like, it was like, remember the Alamo. Let's go. Come on. You them Texans mad. They were, right? I mean, if y'all had heard that lady, you'd have been embarrassed. But she was just expressing what most of us are feeling. And then I realized in that moment, as a Christ follower, I need to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. That I need to make a difference by doing what Jesus has asked me to do. But I need to make a difference by walking in God's blessing in my life so that I can influence change. And that only happens when my heart's right. Come on, y'all. This is just for real. Hey, if you don't want to hear the truth, don't come here. Because this is what we need. We can be righteously angry, but we have to do it with a pure heart. Our motives have to be right. Our actions have to be right. Our words have to be right. And then we lead people. I was thinking about that. Part of my frustration and think about leadership and all that. How we ended up in all this. Blah, 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 and, I, and I was thinking about that. And when you think about leading, there's a difference. I, I was leading cows all week. And, and I learned something a long time ago about cows. It's a lot easier to lead them with a feed bucket than try to push them to do anything. And you ranchers, farmers know what I'm talking about. I, at one point, I was out there with all those cows, and I was like, man, I got to get them from here to there. What am I doing? I went, oh, I got an empty feed bucket. Empty feed bucket. Grabbed that empty feed bucket, banged it on the side of the, and hear that, whoa, food guy, food truck. <laughs> Hope he's got tacos. <laughs> right so what happened is I let them can you imagine trying to push 56 cows to do something if we want to bring change we have to lead change we have to show people a better way 
And the only people we're gonna show, the only way we're gonna show them a better way is by living our lives in such a way that people say, I want what they have. And that's Jesus in you. It's hope that lives in you. It's truth that lives in you. It's life that lives in you to the place where people go, I want that. Why? Philippians 2.15. Again, watch this. That you, everybody say me, may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. If we wanna see change, we need to be the change. And that means letting God have everything in us so that we shine. The light that you can produce is not very, very strong in and of yourself. But when Jesus is living in here, he can shine and change stuff. And your anger, malice, hatred, and all that other stuff ain't gonna change squat. But leading with the love of God inside of you, showing hope, life, peace, being who you're supposed to be as a Christ follower, giving people around you the love of Jesus, that can change stuff. Y'all need to get this on. Some of y'all mad at me. You know, I ain't coming back next week. I'm just going to be mad, mad in my pants. No, come on. Isn't it amazing? This book was written 2,000 years ago. It could have been written yesterday. Right? Think about that. Truth is truth. Amen? Boy, I'm preaching better than y'all are amen. Boy, that's upsetting. I'm going to get mad at y'all now. <laughs> I did that. Okay. Last thing. I'm going to let you off the hook now. You ready? Who wants to be let off the hook? Thank you, Connie, you're off the hook. <laughs> Number three, we need to learn to be quick to repent. If we're gonna keep our hearts pure, we need to be quick to repent. Let me tell you something. If the guy or gal had seen the cow down in the creek day one and pulled it out, would anybody else have gotten sick? Nope. But what happens is when we are slow to repent, decay sets in. I want to tell you something. That's nasty. That's nasty. I shot a hog the other day. No offense to Razorback fans. I pulled it off a couple hundred yards away from the house. A few days later, I looked out. And I saw something moving. So I put the binoculars up and it was a coyote. And he was walking around with a leg in his mouth from that hog. Decayed, nasty flesh. He said, thank you. I said, food truck guy. <laughs> but watch this. Not a decayed, nasty. If I was around you for a little while, for a day, what would I smell? What would I smell? Life? Decay? Come on, ooh. Y'all probably not gonna, y'all want me to go back down for a couple more weeks? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's heart check time. Things don't seem to be getting better. We've gone from one crisis to another to another. Christians, it's time. We, we, the world's looking for hope. And the hope of the world lives inside of us. And maybe, maybe, just maybe, these things are going on and God's going, I need people to come, but they're not going to come until it gets bad. And it's getting bad. And now they're looking for a solution. And I've empowered you to be that solution. So I need you to shine so people can get saved. And then you can come home.
It's interesting, isn't it? It's interesting. Let me tell you something. I wrote this down. I said this the other day. Nothing changes until something changes. We need hope to come alive inside of us. I know it was a little thing the other day, that calf coming up. I know it was a little thing. But they don't do that. And it was just that little God wink there for a moment. I got you. I'm here. If you want to, I'll show you the picture. He's all sticking his head up, eyes all big. We need to put aside wrath and anger. We need to surrender our hearts to the Lord. We need to pray for those in leadership. We need to vote. We need to be the change. Sure. But we don't need to be bitter and miserable until those things change. That's, that's crazy. Let's be part of the solution. Our neighbors, our friends, our families are hurting and they need Jesus you know what I I don't know that I could have made a difference to that lady the other day that was so angry but you know what bothers me is I didn't even think about it I was so upset before I talked to her that when I did talk to her it didn't occur to me that bothers me. I don't want so to let everything going on around me to affect me so much that, that I forget the main thing. And if we allow what we see and hear to affect us instead of believing God's word, it's, I mean, that's the whole point of today is that we can have pure hearts in the midst of this. I'm so proud of those that are part of our congregation that are running for office. That's fantastic. We need them in positions of leadership to bring Jesus into those positions of leadership. But can I tell you something? We need you to do the same thing too. In your business. I mean, I think of you guys, Shelby and Lucas, I love what y'all do. Opening up that window every day, giving everybody coffee, loving on them. That's an opportunity for ministry. Walked into a store the other day to grab something, grocery store. Walked out. Young man behind the counter says, have a blessed day. He for real did. Teenage kid. I'm like, I want to hear that. I'm mad about fuel prices. Mm. <laughs> no, I didn't do that. But you see what I'm saying? My point. Come on now. Come on now. Just enter to an attitude of prayer for a moment, please. I'm going to ask you these questions. While you're in an attitude of prayer, these are the questions that I put on your notes today. Would you consider your heart to be pure? Are you angry? Malice, wrath. Are you unsure about the truth of scripture? Do you believe what God says about you, I put? Do you believe God's word? Do you believe? The final question is this. What areas in your life do you need to surrender to God and repent? What areas? It's kind of a blueprint, y'all. Lord, I just pray right now as we're in this place. I believe your presence is here with us, Lord. I believe your truth, your word has pierced us to the heart. Lord, it pierced me to the heart. Lord, we want to be blessed. And you've called us to, 
be blessed, but to be blessed to be a blessing. But how can I be blessed and be a blessing if I'm not following your word? I can't. So Lord, I'm just asking now in Jesus' name that as we're together in this place, you would allow each one of us just to be honest with ourselves today and examine our hearts. We, some of us need to repent. Some of us need to forgive. Some of us need to believe you, that you've got this. Lord, I'm asking today that you would transform us. Lord, I'm, and, I, and I'm praying, Lord, and I mean this with all my heart, please start with me. Transform me. Lord, help me be part of the change. Let people see Jesus in me. If you're here today, nobody looking around for a moment. If God's really touched you this morning, you realize maybe there's some things you've been dealing with doubt and unbelief, or maybe you realize there's some unforgiveness in your life. Maybe you realize you need to repent about some things. I just want you to do me a favor today. Just slip your hand up and say, Pastor, that is me. Amen. Amen. Thank you for your honesty. Thank you for your honesty. You can put your hands down. Lord, I just pray for each one of those people today. I want to do something. We're just going to take a moment. We're not in a hurry. Just take a moment. If, if you raised your hand today, or maybe you didn't raise your hand, but you're dealing with this, maybe you're at home right now watching online if you're having doubts about God's love for you or that he's involved just right now I want you to confess that to him Lord I have doubts help me understand help me believe Lord show me show me if today you're here and you have some unrepentant sin or you have some unforgiveness in your life, you, you realize you need to forgive someone. It's eating you up. It's polluting people around you. You've held on to it far too long. If that's you, I just want you to take this moment right now. It's a holy moment. We're not gonna pass this up. I want you to forgive that person or those people. You say, Pastor, they don't deserve it. You know what? Maybe they don't. But Jesus died for you. And you didn't deserve it either. Let's forgive that person just right now. You just, just name them. You and the Lord, just name that person. Name those people. Lord, I forgive. Fill in the blank. are being changed right now. This last part about repenting. Some of you have been approaching this wrong. I was. Maybe you need to realize there's some repenting you need to do in your life. So Lord, I just I'm sorry for the way I've handled some of these things. Lord, I just I ask you just to help me, forgive me, repent of those things, Lord. Help me to love, Lord, the way you love, to lead, Lord, the way you lead, to be a light to people, to point them to you. Help me be part of the solution, Lord, not part of the problem. Help me shut my mouth when I need to and only speak when I need to. Speak, Lord, listen to me. When I speak, Lord, let my words be full of love 
and truth. Love and truth. Father, I pray for everyone today that agreed with any of these prayers. Lord, you know them, you know their hearts. And I pray, Father, you would do a miraculous thing. Pray for restoration for people's lives and souls. Lord, I pray for healing. Pray for healing for hearts today and minds and Lord, even bodies of those that have released some of these things. You would touch their bodies, Lord. Lord, I pray that we would be people that would walk out into our family, our community, our friends, our schools, our workplaces, the golf course, wherever we are. Lord, that, that your love would so shine in us that people would see you and want what we have. They've got enough of bitterness. Let's give them some truth and love. Father, I pray for our country right now, Lord. I pray for Ukraine right now, Lord. We lift up those people to you, Father, and pray that you would strengthen them, protect them. Father, we pray that your perfect will would be done. We pray for wisdom, Father, for our leaders. Lord, we pray that you would give them godly, divine wisdom, and then they would respond to it. Father, we pray for our president. We pray for our country, Lord, in Jesus' name. You said if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, repent, then I will hear from heaven. I'll turn and I'll heal, heal their land. Father, today we, we ask you to begin the change with us. And Father, we pray you would restore our land. That we would be a nation under God. The lighthouse of the world, Lord, is what we're supposed to be. Let us be that. Help us, Father. Please help us. In Jesus' name. And all of God's amazing people said, amen, amen. It's good to see you guys. Good to see you guys. Let's stand up this morning. I'm going to pray a blessing over you as you leave. Just know that you... I, I love the scripture. I read a scripture this week that said, you are a peculiar people. <laughs> Talking about us as Christians. I thought that's true because I know some peculiar people. But I want you to know something else. You are a loved people. You are a blessed people. You are the people of God. Let's act like it. Amen. Amen. Pray a blessing over you today and release you. Father, thank you for your anointing. We thank you for your presence. Lord, we love you. As we leave this place, Lord, let us be your hands and feet to our friends, our family, our community. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, amen. God bless you. Have a great week.